I'm Chris Wallace. The woman accusing Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh of attempted rape agrees to testify on Capitol Hill. Brett Kavanaugh is one of the finest human beings you will ever have the privilege of knowing or meeting. President Trump stands by his pick. Even after charges, Kavanaugh engaged in sexual abuse as a teenager. Plus, we have great people in the Department of Justice. We have great people, but there is a lingering stench, and we're going to get rid of that too. The president issues a warning. Following reports, Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein floated the idea of wearing a wire to record him. We'll have a live report and discuss what comes next on both fronts with Lindsey Graham, a key member of the Senate Judiciary Committee. And we'll get analysis from our Sunday panel, including Bob Woodward, author of the best-selling book, Fear. Then, as Mr. Trump heads for the U.N. General Assembly, we talk with Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. The North Koreans have not agreed to give up a single missile, a single nuclear weapon, and the escalating trade war with China. How hard is President Trump prepared to go in this face-off with China, and for how long? And our power player of the week, a soccer icon crosses the pond and makes a splash here in D.C. Oh, right now on Fox News Sunday. And hello again from Fox News in Washington. Well, it looks like we'll have a face-off on Capitol Hill this week between Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh and the woman accusing him of sexual assault 36 years ago when they were both in high school. Christine Blasey Ford has tentatively agreed to testify before the Senate Judiciary Committee on Thursday, but her lawyers and committee staff are still negotiating the details. Right now, we can tell you about the latest Fox News poll, which shows this controversy has hurt public support for the judge. When asked, who do you believe, 36% say the accuser, Ford, while 30% say Kavanaugh. One-third say they're unsure. And when asked whether they support the judge's confirmation to the Supreme Court, voters say no by a margin of 10 points. Last month, before the allegation, the negative margin was just one point. Meanwhile, there's another explosive controversy, whether President Trump will fire Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein after reports that in May of 2017, Rosenstein was so worried about Mr. Trump's behavior, he discussed wearing a wire to record the president and polling cabinet members about invoking the 25th Amendment to remove him from office. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo became the first top administration official to speak on this, when I interviewed him yesterday. Chris, I'm, I'm not going to comment on, on that in any way other than to say this. Um, I've been pretty clear uh, since my beginning of service here in this administration. If you can't be on the team, if you're not supporting this mission, then maybe you just ought to find something else to do. I've told that to my senior colleagues. I've told it to junior folks at the CIA and the State Department. We need everyone who's engaged in helping achieve President Trump's mission. And I hope that everyone in every agency, DOJ, FBI, State Department, is on that mission. And, and if you're not, if you're not, you should take this time to go do something more productive. And I assume that talking about wiring the president, talking about the 25th Amendment, is not being on the team. Not remotely. We'll have more of our interview with Pompeo later this hour. But first, let's get the latest on all these developments from Fox News Chief Congressional Correspondent Mike Emanuel on Capitol Hill. Mike. Chris, while there is a tentative agreement for this hearing, it is still not entirely clear if it will happen. Vice President Pence says in the end, the Senate will confirm. I believe that Judge Brett Kavanaugh will soon be Justice Brett Kavanaugh. But first, the effort continues to have Christine Blasey Ford tell her story to lawmakers, with Kavanaugh given a chance to respond. Chairman Grassley has threatened to go right to a committee vote on Monday if there is no deal. And a White House spokeswoman responding, one week ago, Dr. Christine Ford claimed she was assaulted at a House party attended by four others. Since then, all four of these individuals have provided statements to the Senate Judiciary Committee denying any knowledge of the incident or even having attended such a party. Then there's a controversy following the bombshell New York Times report on Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein. 
Advisors to Mr. Trump are strongly urging the president not to follow through on threats to fire him. Rosenstein was quick to deny the report. I never pursued or authorized recording the president, and any suggestion that I have ever advocated for the removal of the president is absolutely false. On Judge Kavanaugh with a 51-49 Republican majority, the key will be keeping the GOP unified. Chris? Mike Emanuel reporting from Capitol Hill. Thanks for that. Joining me now, a key member of the Judiciary Committee, Republican Senator Lindsey Graham. We should note, for the second week in a row, we invited all 10 committee Democrats to join us, and for the second week, none of them accepted. And with that, Senator Graham, welcome back to Fox News Sunday. You must be mean. <laughs> well, or they don't want to talk. What's the latest on okay. negotiations over having this hearing? What issues have been settled? What issues are still outstanding? And how close are you to getting fed up with a witness dictating to the committee in terms of her testimony? Well, uh, uh, Chairman Bresley's been over backwards to make this happen. The offer is Thursday at 10 o'clock. She made 10 conditions through her lawyer. We accepted six. We're not going to turn over to the other side uh, how many witnesses to call. There'll be two witnesses, Dr. Ford, then uh, Judge Kavanaugh, and we'll hire our own counsel. Uh, they contest those two things. If they continue to contest those two things, they won't be a hearing. If they really want to be heard, they can be heard in a small room with a lot of security, limited press availability. She'll be treated fairly, but we're not going to turn the hearing over to her lawyers. And we'll see. I hope she comes. I will listen if she does. So are you saying that the committee has basically given her a take it or leave it? These are the conditions. We've, we've, we've bent enough. Here are the conditions. You either accept this or there'll be no hearing? Well, she made uh, 10 conditions, a request for 10, we gave six. We're not going to let her determine how many people we call. We're called Dr. Ford, then Mr. Kavanaugh is the way you would do it in any other situation. And we'll hire our own lawyers, and that's it. If they can't accept that, that means they really don't want to testify. Judge Kavanaugh is ready to go right now, Monday, Thursday, any time. And here's what I tell my colleagues. This accusation has to be looked at in terms of the, our legal system. It's too old for a criminal uh, trial. It's 36 years old. Uh, you couldn't bring a civil suit because you can't tell the court where, what time it happened and where it happened. And if you tried to get a warrant based on this, you couldn't get a warrant because the three people named by Dr. Ford as having been at the party outside of Kavanaugh all say they don't know what she's talking about. So you couldn't go to criminal trial. You couldn't sue civilly. You couldn't even get a warrant. But I will listen to what she has to say. I, I want to ask you about one of these conditions or one of the things that you've rejected, the idea that an outside counsel, a woman, will do the questioning for your side. Yeah. Is that pure optics? Is that basically that the 11 men who are on the Republican side of the Judiciary <laughs> Committee don't want to be seen as being disrespectful or insensitive to a woman who, accuse, uh, who says that she was the victim of sexual abuse? Well, we've got 11 politicians who haven't done a trial in about 20 years. I thought it'd be really smart to have somebody come in and know what the hell they're doing, to ask the questions, to be respectful. You know, I don't know what uh, Dr. Ford expected us to do with an anonymous letter. If she wanted to stay anonymous, those who betrayed her need to apologize. But she will be treated respectfully, but she will be challenged, just like Judge. Kavanaugh. When I voted for Sotomayor and Kagan, I wasn't just a white male Republican. I was some kind of really smart, uh, wonderful person. I know what the game is here. I am no different now than I was then. I may ask questions if I feel the need to, but I think it'd be smart to have a professional litigator do this. Give Ms. Uh, Ford, uh, Dr. Ford a chance to be heard. Give Dr. Uh, Judge Kavanaugh a chance to be heard. Compare what she says with everything else in the record, and I'll make a decision. President Trump was pretty restrained on this issue until Friday when he tweeted yeah. this. I have no doubt that if the attack on Dr. Ford was as bad as she says, charges would have been immediately filed. I ask that she bring those filings forward so that we can learn date, time, and place. Now, you know, and I know, that Ford yeah. has said that she didn't say anything about this to anyone for decades, and that brought the president's tweet, a sharp response from one of the few undecided key Republican senators, Susan Collins. Look. 
I was appalled by the president's tweet. We know that allegations of sexual assault are one of the most unreported crimes that exist. So I thought that the president's tweet was completely inappropriate and wrong. Senator, does the president realize, and frankly, do you realize that if you're seen, if all of you are seen as not right. treating this woman sensitively, respectfully, that this nomination could go down? Well, here's what I do know. I was a prosecutor, defense attorney, and a judge. For every woman that comes forward uh, regarding an allegation like this, God only knows how many never come forward. Also know that sometimes people are accused of things they didn't do. I would advise the president to let us handle this. It is very true that a lot of women get abused and take it to their grave. And every now and then you have a situation where people uh, provide inaccurate information. All I can say about this allegation is too old for a criminal trial. You never bring a lawsuit because it's uncertain. You could even get a warrant because the people who are supposedly validating what Dr. Ford said right. all say they weren't there, they don't know what she's talking about. That's the context of this case. But meanwhile, Senate Democrats, a lot of them women, say that you and your side have already <laughs> insulted Dr. Ford. Take a look at this. I consider that to be bullying. I consider that to be disregarding. I consider that to be something set up for failure. Guess who's perpetuating all of these kinds of actions? It's the men in this country. And I just want to say to the men in this country, just shut up and step up. Your reaction, Senator? Well, Senator Scott and myself represent the people of South Carolina. We got elected by men and women of our state. I am not going to shut up with all due respect. When I voted for Sotomayor and Kagan, nobody on the other side told me to shut up. They told me how fair I was, how good I was. All I would tell my colleagues, I know you hate Trump. I am going to look at this from a prism of being reasonable and fair to Judge Kavanaugh. Everything I know about Judge Kavanaugh goes against this allegation. I want to listen to Dr. Ford. I feel sorry for her. I think she's being used here. People, in my view, are using her. If she truly wanted to be anonymous, the person who brought this accusation to the public owes her an apology. I will do the following. Listen to Dr. Ford. Compare that to everything in the record and make a decision. This accusation is 36 years old. I don't know when it happened. I don't know where it happened. And all the people who have been named say it didn't happen. So these two senators have an agenda uh, that's related to their hatred for uh, President Trump. I'm trying to be fair here and get this thing done in a reasonable way to uh, Judge Kavanaugh as well as Dr. Ford. Senator, I'm sure that some of the people listening to you would say, you know, you've, you've several times now you've talked about how weak her case is, how, how, how long ago it was, the lack of details, yeah. the lack of any right. corroborating evidence. Do you have an open mind on this and is there anything that Dr. Ford could say that would persuade you to vote against Kavanaugh's nomination, honestly. I want, I want to listen to her, but I'm being honest with you and everybody else. What do you expect me to do? You can't bring it in a criminal court. You would never sue civilly. You couldn't even get a warrant. What am I supposed to do? Go ahead and ruin this guy's life based on an accusation. I don't know when it happened. I don't know where it happened. And everybody named in regard to being there said it didn't happen. I'm just being honest. Unless there's something more, no, I'm not going to ruin uh, uh, Judge Kavanaugh's life over this. But she should come forward. She should have her say. She will be respectfully treated. What did you expect us to do with an anonymous letter to begin with? What do you expect somebody to do with an accusation this vague, not right. verified in any way? Bring it forward. I will listen. But I'm not going to play a game here and tell you this will wipe out his entire life because if nothing changes it won't with me I, I i just want to point out as a fact and i'm going to move on because we're running out of time that there is no statute of limitations on sex assault cases in maryland so there are weaknesses with the case obviously but she could legally bring it i just want to turn well it I, would go nowhere <laughs> okay i want to turn to reports that deputy attorney general rosenstein was so concerned about president in May of 2017 that he reportedly talked about wearing a wire to tape the president, polling the cabinet about invoking the 25th Amendment. Right. Should 
One last question here. Should the president fire Rosenstein? And to what degree does this revelation taint, compromise the investigation by the special counsel, Robert Mueller, whom Rosenstein appointed? He shouldn't fire Rosenstein unless you believe Rosenstein's lying. He said he did not do the things alleged. But there's a bureaucratic coup against President Trump being un un discovered here. Before the election, the people in question tried to taint the election, tip it to Clinton's favor. After the election, they're trying to undermine the president. I don't know what Rosenstein did, but I know what McCabe or uh, Page, Page and Strzok did. They tried to destroy this president. If Rosenstein's involved, he should be fired. If he's not involved, uh, leave him alone. But he can't make that decision. We need a special counsel to look at this, not Mr. Horowitz, the IG. Rosenstein's doing the country a great disservice by not appointing a special counsel to look at all of this. When you say all of this, you're talking about the FBI's behavior in investigating the president. And as far as Robert Mueller is concerned, yes. does that investigation go forward? It goes forward. As far as I know, there's nothing connected to Mr. Mueller. But during the campaign, it's clearly Department of Justice, the FBI, was tipping the scales for Clinton. This revelation after President Trump was sworn in right. shows they were trying to undermine the election. There's a bureaucratic coup going on at the Department of Justice and FBI, and somebody needs to look at it. Senator Graham, thank you. Thanks for your time. Thank we'll you. follow whatever happens with the Judiciary thank Committee you. this week. Thank you. Up next, we'll bring in our Sunday group to discuss those reports. Rod Rosenstein had such serious doubts about President Trump's fitness, he discussed ways to remove him from office. Plus, what would you like to ask the panel about the accusation of sexual misconduct against Judge Brett Kavanaugh? Just go to Facebook or Twitter at Fox News Sunday, and we may use your question on the air. She clearly considers this an attempted rape. She believes that if it were not for the severe intoxication of Kavanaugh, she would have been raped. If she shows up and makes a credible showing, that'll be very interesting and we'll have to make a decision. The lawyer for Christine Blasey Ford and President Trump on the allegation to the Supreme Court. And it's time now for our Sunday group, Katie Pavlich from townhall.com. Juan Williams, columnist for The Hill, and author of the new book, What the Hell Do You Have to Lose? From the Washington Post, Bob Woodward, author of the bestseller, Fear, Trump in the White House, and Fox News correspondent Jillian Turner, who has no book to hawk this week. <laughs> well, maybe I'm working on one. Well, okay. <laughs> then we'll put that book up. All right, Bob, where do you think the Kavanaugh nomination stands now? And assuming we have this hearing, what's going to determine whether or not he gets confirmed to the Supreme Court. I, uh, what a moment. Where's Cecil B. DeMille, uh, the great filmmaker? Uh, he, in 1952, he did a movie called about a circus called The Greatest Show on Earth. This is about what we are going to experience. I think the good news for both sides uh, is, and I think this is little known, Senator Grassley is a real advocate of whistleblowers. He's been the person behind all the acts. And uh, so he's going to make sure that both of them get to do it in an open, kind of fair-minded way. I think he's very sensitive to Dr. Ford's position on this. He's given speeches about the retribution that can be visited on a whistleblower. So uh, in a sense, uh, not perfect, but she's got significant protection. And she has gotten at least five or six concessions from the committee this, so far in terms of, well, what day it's going to be held, the conditions in, under which this could be held. But I think it's important to note that Lindsey Graham made it clear this is not a done deal yet. We ask you for questions for the panel. And on this accusation of sexual misconduct against Judge Kavanaugh, we got this on Facebook from Glenn Dutra. Why is the committee letting the Democrats and her lawyers call all the shots about the hearing? Katie, how do you answer, Glenn? Well, it's a very sensitive issue. And as Bob said, uh, Senator Grassley has dedicated his entire career to protecting people who 
come forward with accusations in a way that can be credible and meaningful, listened to, and then bared out on results. But the problem here is that uh, Christine Blasey Ford's attorneys have turned this into a game. The Senate, the majority on the Senate Judiciary Committee has done everything possible to make this happen. They've given multiple extensions, and as you just said, they've agreed to showing up for a hearing, but they also say that there are details that have to be worked out. Now, last week, the details of those conditions were Brett Kavanaugh testifying first, unable to respond to the accusations, uh, her testifying without him in the room. There are still things that have to be worked out in terms of where we go from here. And the bottom line is, because her attorneys have turned this into a political game, we don't know a lot about the accuser, but we sure know a lot about where her attorneys are coming from. Republicans are going to have to make a decision about when that ultimate deadline is and if they're going to move forward with the hearing or move forward with a vote, and her attorneys have uh, the balls in their court when it comes to whether she's going to testify ahead of that vote. But Jillian, in this Me Too era, if no matter how fair or unfair uh, the demands from the lawyers are, if the Republican majority, 11 men, are seen as cutting off and preventing this woman from telling her story, that's going to be political dynamite, isn't it? Everybody's saying they want hearings. Both sides are eager, chomping at the bit for a hearing and for, for her to testify, but there's a lot of downside and not a lot of upside for both Republicans and Democrats here. I'd say that when it comes to the politics, Chuck Grassley's seat might not be on the line in November, but he is the most vulnerable lawmaker on Capitol Hill right now. His late night tweet storm on Friday uncharacteristically beleaguered sounding underscores to Playing me. Playing second trombone in the band. Exactly. Just very uncharacteristic for him and I think underscores the catch-22 of the situation he's in politically. The Democrats were going to be angry at him no matter how he handled this. I think the MAGA crowd was, they're angry at him because they feel now he's being spineless. And then the anti-Trump conservatives feel that he's turning his back on a core principle I guess they've described it as the principle that the accused uh, doesn't have to bear the responsibility of proving their innocence. So it's a lose-lose for him. Let's turn to the other big story this week, and that is the report in the New York Times that in May of 2017, sh shortly after he took office, Rod Rosenstein, the deputy attorney general, was so concerned about Donald Trump's behavior that he talked to some of his colleagues at Justice and the FBI about wearing wire to secretly tape the president and also polling cabinet members about invoking the 25th amendment to the constitution to unseat him. Uh, here's the one thing that President Trump has said about this so far. You've seen what's happened at the FBI. They're all gone. They're all gone. They're all gone. But there's a lingering stench and we're going to get rid of that too. Juan, what do you make of this story, and what do you think the president's going to do when he talks about that lingering stench? Well, the, the real news here is that the president has authorized release of this FISA document, released of also some of these emails, this transaction. That's how we know about the McCabe email that suggests that Rod Rosenstein was looking at the 25th Amendment or taping, secretly taping the president. Uh, I think it's a fool's errand for a journalist to speculate as to is it right, is it wrong, but I will note this, there's no evidence that he actually pursued or actually did it. You'll note in his statement, Chris, he says, I never authorized or pursued such activity. So if, there, if that becomes clear that in fact he's lying about it, then that's something else. But my point to you is this, the president wants that FISA document released, a lot of his supporters especially the hard right people in the Freedom Caucus of the House, Devin Nunes and others, have pushed this idea, get it out there, because it would therefore justify the president going after this investigation, not only firing Rosenstein, but remember, he just tweeted this week, he doesn't have an attorney general. He's still going after Jeff Sessions for not reining this thing in. So he's after Rosenstein, he's after Sessions, and I think he's after damaging the credibility, ultimately, of Robert Mueller. Bob, there is this dispute, and frankly, different papers in town are on different sides of this issue, whether or not Rosenstein, he apparently said it, at least the part about wearing the wire. There's a question as to whether he was serious right. or whether he was being sarcastic. I have to say, on the overall issue of concern and to some degree, chaos or disarray in the White House, this reads like a chapter right out of your book. Um, it does. Uh, and, uh, but the whole question, and, and this is the great advantage of working long term on a book like this, you can check and you can 
and talk to enough people. Was he joking or was he not? And the key issue was action taken, and I've seen no evidence that action was taken. But on this business, of the FBI and the Justice Department and you had Lindsey Graham saying let's have another special counsel to investigate the oh that's exactly what we need another special counsel to get to the bottom of things there is at the same time a smell about all of this and what the FBI has done it does and the Justice Department does not have clean hands but we can't live in an environment where we're going to solve all our problems with massive special counsel investigations. You really have to let somebody kind of clean house and figure this out. All right. We have to take a break here. We'll see you all a little later. When we come back, our interview with Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. We discuss some other big issues, North Korea, China, Iran, and the president's controversial order to declassify key documents in the Russia investigation. <laughs> President Trump heads to the United Nations tomorrow to spend the week meeting with world leaders. On his plate, North Korea, China, and Iran. Ahead of his trip, we went to the State Department yesterday to discuss global tensions with Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Mr. Secretary, welcome back to Fox News Sunday. It's great to be with you, Chris. This week, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un talked about dismantling missile test sites, nuclear fuel facilities. President Trump called it very positive. We had uh, very good news from North Korea, South Korea. Uh, they met and uh, we had some great responses. Uh, we're making tremendous progress with respect to North Korea. But the North Koreans have not agreed to give up a single missile, a single nuclear weapon, nor are they giving us the inventory of their arsenal. Is that tremendous progress? You have to step back where we began this administration uh, with a well-developed program inside of North Korea. We have now achieved uh, the ceasing of missile testing, the ceasing of nuclear uh, testing. We have gotten the remains of 55 Americans. We're in deep discussions about how to proceed with respect to denuclearization. President Moon traveled to Pyongyang for the third time uh, this past week and made progress. We're continuing to make progress. These are all the right steps forward. It's the right path. And we've made clear to the world that the economic sanctions, the pressure that has caused Chairman Kim to come as far as he has come to date will remain in effect until denuclearization occurs. And so we're hard at it. President Trump has given me a task to use our entire diplomatic team to achieve the outcome that the world has demanded through UN Security Council resolutions. We'll talk a lot about that in the week ahead in New York. But again, you talked about denuclearization. They haven't given up a single nuclear weapon or missile or an inventory. And now they're talking in the meeting, the summit with South Korean President Moon, they talked about corresponding measures such as a treaty to end the Korean War. One, is that on the table? And two, whatever happened to the position of the administration that North Korea has to get rid of all of its arsenal before we give any concessions? Administration's position hasn't changed in one jot from the time we entered this discussion. Uh, we are working diligently to achieve many of the outcomes that you described. We've had extended conversations about this. I don't want to get into the details of the negotiations that are underway, but we've talked about particular facilities, particular weapon systems. Those conversations are underway, and we are hopeful that we can deliver this outcome for the world. But to get to this point about corresponding measures, you say the position hasn't changed one bit. Does that mean they have to get rid of their entire nuclear arsenal and missiles before we take, we give concessions, for instance, a peace treaty. Everybody's got their own idea what a concession might be. Some thought it was a concession for President Trump to go to Singapore. I, I certainly didn't think so. President Trump doesn't. Uh, but what we've made clear is the economic sanctions, the driving force to achieve the outcome we're looking for will not be released. Uh, the UN Security Council will not reduce those sanctions until such time as we've achieved that final denuclearization. I, I want to pick up on that because the South Koreans are already talking about renewing economic relations with South Korea. The Russians and the Chinese are looking the other way. There's been apparently rampant smuggling of oil, fuel into South Korea. Isn't the U.S. policy 
maximum pressure on North Korea. Isn't that releasing its grip? Absolutely not. I mean, it just I, I, I hear I've read what you, you should um, you should be very careful about everything that you read in the press around the world. The entire U.N. Security Council remains committed to enforcing the U.N. Security Council resolutions. I am confident we will renew that and renew the commitments to that in the week ahead. It's one of the things we'll talk a great deal about to to a country. Every nation has told me personally they remain committed to enforcing the U.N. Security Council resolution. Let's turn to China, where we are on the verge of a major trade war. The U.S. has imposed sanctions or tariffs on $250 billion of Chinese imports. The Chinese have retaliated. They have just announced they're pulling out of a new round of trade talks this week. How hard is President Trump prepared to go in this face-off with China, and for how long? We know this much. The trade war on, by China against the United States has been going on for years. Uh, here's what's different in this administration. To the extent one wants to call this a trade war, we are determined to win it. You know, I, I ran a small business in Kansas before I came to Congress. I saw how companies were treated differently when they attempted to do business, whether they were trying to sell goods into China or to purchase goods to export from China. I watched how American companies were treated unfairly, differently, a different set of rules. If they wanted to invest in my business in Kansas, they could have. Had I wanted to invest in a Chinese supplier there, I couldn't. These are fundamentally unfair. The American people know that, and President Trump's going to fix it. When you say he's, you're going to win it. Yeah, we're going to win it. As long as it takes? We're going to win it. We're, we're going to get an outcome which forces China to be in a way that if you want to be a power, a global power, transparency, rule of law, uh, you don't deal intellectual property, the fundamental principles of trade around the world, fairness, reciprocity, those are the things President Trump has told his counterpart there, who he very much likes. Uh, those are the things the American people are demanding and the American workers deserve. President Trump announced this week that he's reducing the number of refugees that will be allowed into this country from 45,000 this year to 30,000 next year, which would be the lowest cap since the refugee program began in 1980. Now, take, for instance, Syria. There are 5 million Syrian refugees now in the Middle East. The U.S. has allowed only 60 Syrian refugees into this country this fiscal year, which ends next week. Is that this administration's idea of compassion? Chris, this country has been the most generous nation in all of recorded civilization with respect to taking refugees from around the world and admitting people from outside of the United States. It continues to be so under President Trump and will be during our administration. Let's talk about the refugees in Syria. The best place for those refugees to go back to would be to their homes. It's where they want to go. We've provided billions of dollars in aid in humanitarian aid all around the world in the Trump administration. And we've let in over four million people to our country over the past two decades. This is a generous nation. To focus just on this legal term refugees, on this notion of refugees, doesn't encompass the full scope of American generosity. Second point, President Trump is also committed to making sure America is secure. And the vetting that's taking place is important. It reduces risk in the American homeland. And then finally, the work that we've done to get our allies to share this burden. Uh, we now have hundreds of million dollars coming in from Gulf states to support Syrian reconstruction and redevelopment, things that never happened. This was good work driven by the president, led by American diplomacy, to get other countries to share the burden of making sure that these refugees are well taken care of. New subject. This week, the president ordered the release of previously classified documents about the Russia investigation. That release has been delayed, at least temporarily, but he says they show that the Russia probe began as a hoax. It's a terrible witch hunt, and it's hurt our country. And uh, the things that have been found over the last couple of weeks about text messages back and forth are a disgrace to our nation. You were CIA director until just this May. Did you see any legitimate reason to investigate ties between any Trump associates and the Kremlin? Did you see any legitimate basis to surveil Carter Page? I've consistently said I'm not going to talk about the investigation. I had the role of CIA director, and so I don't have anything to add to that today. But can you tell us whether or not it was a hoax or whether there were legitimate national security concerns? 
Oh, I've been very clear. Uh, we have real risk to uh, outside agents trying to do harm to America. There's no mistake about that. Uh, there are many countries seeking to meddle in our elections. The Chinese, the Iranians, the North Koreans, and certainly what the Russians did in 2016 are all clear indications that there are those who want to undermine American democracy, and we have an obligation, both the intelligence community, our military, our diplomats, all of the U.S. government, to prevent that from ever happening. Finally, there was an attack on a military parade in Iran this weekend in which at least 24 people were killed. And your Iranian counterpart, Foreign Minister Zarif, blames it on the U.S. Did the U.S. play any role in that attack? And do you have any plans or does the president have any plans to meet with Iranian officials this next week? at the U.N. General Assembly. Well, let me take your second question first. Um, I don't know that there are any plans to date. The president's been pretty clear. If there are constructive conversations to be had with the Iranians, the president is happy to have them. Uh, he'd be willing to do so. Even with President Rouhani this uh, week? Boy, the, you're the leader of the country is the Ayatollah Khamenei. <laughs> That's who's running the show in Iran. I think, I think that would be an important and interesting conversation. With respect wait, wait, to, I mean, are you just, is that talk, or are you just saying you would like, the president would like to meet with the Ayatollah? The, the president said he'll talk with anyone if we can have a constructive conversation. We want Iran to stop being the large, world's largest state sponsor of terror. Uh, but make no mistake about it, there's no indication that they have any intent of doing this. Just this past couple of weeks, they've come after American interests inside of Iraq, in Basra, and in Baghdad. And with respect to the attacks overnight, I saw the comments of Zarif. When you have a security incident at home, Blaming others is an enormous mistake. And the loss of innocent lives is tragic. And I wish Zarif would focus on keeping his own people secure rather than causing insecurity all around the world. Mr. Secretary, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Good luck this next week at the UN. Thank you, sir. Up next, we'll bring back our Sunday panel to discuss Secretary Pompeo's tough talk about a number of trouble spots. And more from our latest Fox News poll. How does the battle for control of Congress look just six weeks before the midterms? It also covered North Korea and Iran. And we're back now with the panel. Jillian, as our foreign policy expert, that I've now offended everybody Without else. a book. On the panel, <laughs> without a book. What stands out for you, uh, not just China, of all the things that Pompeo said? Pompeo continued a thread that's been, it started two weeks ago when Bolton appeared at the Federalist Society, gave his first big speech as National Security Advisor. It continued through Nikki Haley's interviews last week and now your sit down with Pompeo today. And that is, the administration is really hitting the reset button. They're going back to square one, just in time for UNGA, which is return. To UN America, for the UN General Assembly return to this emphasis on America first. The message is loud and clear. Everybody's on the same same page. It's as if all the cabinet went to the same briefing, took the same exact notes, and they said, right, North Korea, China, Russia, all of these issues we're facing unilaterally. But we have to remind the American people now at one and a half years in that it's America first. And Pompeo really hit that hit that high note on every single one of the issues you asked him about today. So that jumped out at me. Bob, you write a lot in your book, Fear, about President Trump's attitude towards North Korea. I thought that was interesting that for all the things that Kim Jong-un has not done since the Singapore summit, Pompeo clearly wanted to accentuate the positive. Well, he did, but uh, uh, in the book, I spent a lot of time on North Korea because as President Obama told President Trump as he was coming in, this is what will keep you up at night. Uh, and it, it's a very serious matter, and there almost was a war. I mean, I, I lay it out. It was frightening, and the people in the Pentagon were horrified that President Trump was thinking about withdrawing dependence in South Korea because there was a back channel message to the White House saying if you do that, that will be a signal that war is imminent. So that didn't happen. I think Pompeo's right, we're talking uh, so much better to be talking. The intelligence people say in a very direct way. North Korea, but to keep the dialogue, and if it's a path that takes uh, decades, fine. I want to go back to the Fox News poll because with just 44 days until the midterms, there's some very interesting 
numbers in the poll. Let's put them up. On the generic ballot question, who do you back in your district? 49% of likely voters now say the Democratic candidate. 42% say the Republicans, so Democrats plus seven. And this may be a big reason why. When asked which issues are extremely important to them, 55% say a candidate who shares their view on health care, followed by taxes, immigration, and President Trump. And on that top issue, there's growing support, <clears throat> excuse me, there's growing support for Obama. 36% now say the law went too far. You can see that's down by 12 points. But 51% say Obamacare is about right or didn't go far enough. Katie, what do you make of those numbers? And there's also a number showing that 64% of people think that they want more people insured, even if it costs the government more money, which goes in the direction of what Democrats have been arguing for for years. When it comes to the economy, the problem for Republicans is they have been campaigning on tax reform, saying that more people have money in their pockets. That is true, but according to this polling um, experience with having more money uh, for their families as a result of tax reform, and about a third of voters say that it's made no difference in the economy. That's a big problem because that's been the main message from Republicans. That's what they've been doing on Capitol Hill. Next week, Republicans are planning to vote in the House on tax.